How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. And yes, it is Black Friday here on the show, and we're live. We got a lot to talk about here today because, of course, we were not here yesterday. It was American Thanksgiving. And I can always tell who on my Twitter is uh, an American and who is from uh, overseas because the people that go, how come there's no Observer Live today? Well, they were unaware that today was Thanksgiving. So that's why there was no show yesterday. But we are here today, and we have a lot to talk about because it is a busy weekend. We have got the Survivor Series War Games pay-per-view, which is coming up tomorrow, Saturday. Another Saturday pay-per-view. And we have five matches announced for the show. And uh, not one of them is a Survivor Series match. We have got... A men's war games, a women's war games, a women's championship match, which I don't know why they're bothering. We have got a one-on-one match with about 50 guys and ladies at ringside. And we have a three-way for the United States title. It is possible on the SmackDown show tonight that they'll add a traditional Survivor Series match. But I don't really know what that would be. But Mike and I are going to do the uh, prediction game for the uh for the show here today we've also got notes on a second wrestle kingdom event that has been announced january 21st at the yokohama arena it will be the second night of wrestle kingdom this year not two nights back to back and uh it is likely to be some sort of joint show will it be noah will it be AEW? We shall soon find out. Rey Mysterio, they did an angle on social media, taking him out of action. Ric Flair says he's going to be back to WWE, NXT ratings. And yes, in the final segment of the show, it will be the world-famous Dynamite Report, the AEW Dynamite Report. So we're going to kick it all off after the break. Stick around, everybody. Back with Mike Sempervivi, Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. And yes... We're all here. We are all connected for the show here today. Isn't that right, Mike? That's right, Brian. I believe if the technology say some words here, here. so that guy on Twitter can uh, can mark down that your first words were said at twelve twelve p.m. today on Black Friday. Yes, everybody, we're live on Black Friday, and there is a Black Friday sale on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com. So for those of you that have uh, thought about signing up or wondered what it was all about, we plugged it here and there, but have never done so, 99 cents. We haven't done 99 cents in like uh, 15 years, I think was the last time we did a 99 cent Black Friday deal. And we're trying it out here. So uh, yes, for 99 cents, for one dollar... You can get a full month of WrestlingObserver.com, which means you get every show that we do uh, available for podcasts, Wrestling Observer Live, Wrestling Observer Radio, The Brian and Vinny Show, Figure Four Daily with Landstorm, Filthy Four Daily with Tom Lawler. I hear Mike does a big audio nightmare. We got Les Thatcher and uh, Carl Stern, Josh Nason. I think we have about 78 podcasts, Denise and uh, and, uh, Jim Valley. And Andrew Zarian. Who am I missing? Anybody? Anybody going to get mad? But anyway, all of those shows every week you can listen to for your 99 cents. Or uh, you can also go back in the archive. There are 17 years worth of shows, which at last count, we have we have exceeded, what did I say, 12,000? 14,000? I think the front page says 12,000, but I think the actual number is uh, 14,000 some ridiculous number of podcasts but anyway they're all up there right now for you at 99 cents go to wrestlingobserver.com it's right there on the front page 99 cents for a full month of wrestlingobserver.com don't miss out didn't even mention the newsletters you ever heard of the wrestling observer newsletter yeah thousands of editions up there there's a new one every week except coincidentally this week Every Tuesday, Vinny, Craig, Sean, we all go back and we watch 1993 Raws. So you can watch the show we're watching. You can listen to the podcast where we review it. You can go to the archives and read the 1993 Observer Newsletter from that week to really find out what's going on on that show. It's unbelievable what you can do for just 99 
sense. Now, with that said, we'll talk more about that later. We've got uh, shows coming up this weekend. We'll talk about Dynamite later. But uh, Saturday is the War Games show. We have five matches announced for the show. And uh, Mike and I are going to be doing some predictions here. Because last, last time people seemed to enjoy the prediction show that we did, talking about the Full Gear pay-per-view. And I don't think we ever went back and found out who won. I think the only what was the only thing we ag- disagreed on. What was the one thing we disagreed on? The, the acclaimed? acclaimed. The acclaimed. Yes. And you and you won. I did. Right that's, down to believing funny. that they may put two belts on one man, and they did that with Samoa Joe. So, hmm. big W for me. I'm gonna need to go back and make sure that you're uh, you're accurate with that statement. Well, here are the matches for Survivor Series. And uh, and I vow to win this time. We've got a women's war games match. We got Bianca, Alexa, Asuka, Mia, and TBA versus Bailey, Dakota Kai, Io Sky, Nikki Cross, Rhea Ripley. Women's war games. Uh, you'll be stunned to know that the uh, the heels have the woman advantage, and uh, it is expected. And nothing is official till it happens, but it is expected that the mystery person here is going to be Becky Lynch. And so, uh, what's your prediction, Mike? Who's winning this match? I say it is going to be the baby faces, and one of the last people that will be standing tall will be, I predict, Becky Lynch, who I believe will be the TBA in that match. Well, finally, I will have a chance to defeat you, Mike, in the prediction contest, because I predict that the heels are going to win, because I believe that Rhea Ripley's team is going to win. Rhea Ripley is going to get the victory for the team, maybe on Bianca Belair, but one way or the other, I think this is going to set up Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair for the women's title, hence a win by Rhea Ripley. That is my prediction for the match. Then we got the uh, men's war games. Sheamus, Ridge Holland, Butch, Drew McIntyre, and Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns, Solo Sokoa, Sami Zayn, and the Usos. What is your prediction in this match? This is a really interesting one here. Could Sami do something which causes his team to ultimately lose? Or does he do something maybe against his will or he has to stand by and watch Kevin Owens get laid out, which then continues the story of Sami and Kevin's friendship and how that, what a tough position that that puts Sami in. So I don't know. I think you can go either way with this. I think if you wanted to beat Roman Reigns, This is a good time to do it. So I don't know who's going to be standing tall at the end here, but I'll say, I'll say Kevin Owens, maybe even Drew McIntyre, they end up standing tall at the end because of some backfiring that goes on within the bloodline. Well, I I don't know who's going to win this match, and I'm going to tell you why. Because initially I thought that somebody should beat Roman Reigns, and uh, that's probably what is going to happen. Or if someone doesn't beat Roman Reigns, somebody should beat somebody on Roman Reigns' team. And you've got uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn in there. And so I think something is going to happen involving Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. And the reason for that is, as we're going to talk about here in a moment, Ricky Starks ended up winning that World Title Eliminator Tournament. He was in the finals. And if you recall, they uh, did an injury angle with Ricky Starks. And uh, he had actually been, he had, a, he had an injury, a legitimate injury of some sort that caused them to have to uh, delay his match and then rebook the final so they weren't on the pay-per-view. And I saw that, and I knew, I didn't know he was going to win, but I knew that he was going to be in the finals. Because if he wasn't going to be in the finals, then if he was legitimately injured, you could have just put him out of the tournament and replaced him with somebody. But the fact that they delayed the entire tournament and the finals told me that Ricky Starks needed to be there. So why did I bring that up? Well, Kevin Owens is injured. He has an injury of some sort. And uh, the word was he was not moving very well on that injury. And if you watch his return on SmackDown, I mean, he did very little in his his return to SmackDown last Friday. But they're clearly taping this guy up, and they're making sure that he can be in this match. They could have put 
somebody else in the match. But they're making sure that a guy with a bad leg is in the match, which tells me that he's needed for something. And to me, that something is an angle involving Sami Zayn. Now, we were talking also a while ago about uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, fighting for the tag team titles, and we, uh, we brought up Montreal. And the question was, should they do this in Montreal, or should they do this at WrestleMania? Well, as was brought to my attention the other day, uh, Jimmy Uso, I don't think, can make it into Canada, which tells me that uh, there's probably not going to be a tag team title match in Montreal. So whatever they're going to do to get to Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, that doesn't even need to be done until we're almost at WrestleMania. So I think doing a full split with Sami and the Bloodline tomorrow night is too early. So I think there's going to be a tease. I think that it'll probably be Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns in Montreal. That will lead to something involving Sami, and then they'll do the tag match. So my point is, I don't think you need to rush all of this. I think there's going to be a tease for Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, and I think that Drew is probably the guy that's either going to get the win or end up next in line for Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble. And then he'll do Rumble, Kevin Owens will do uh, uh, Montreal, and then Kevin and Sammy gets to Usos at WrestleMania. Yeah, and you now know what, what that means you... as far as to who wins? I guess Drew McIntyre. And you know what, too, in my mind, I keep having to separate War Games and Survivor Series. you got to remember that these things, there is no not going to be one Survivor. So, you know, how Sammy or Kevin, you know, put in a position to give up and cause some stress that way? I guess we'll see. Back in a moment with more of the preview, Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. It was brought to my attention during the break. I forgot about Sheamus. Yeah. I would say that Sheamus actually is more likely than Drew McIntyre to bro kick, pin somebody, and be the number one contender for the Royal Rumble. So uh, I think one way or the other, we're all predicting the babyface are winning somehow and we're going to get a challenger. So it could be any number of people, but I do think now actually Sheamus is probably more likely than Drew because we got Drew just a few months ago, Clash of the Castle. And uh, Sheamus is, uh, he's hot. Hasn't got a uh, title shot in a long time. Was super hot after that first match with uh, Gunter. So I would say that uh, Sheamus Bro kicks someone's head off and uh, wins that match for the men. Anybody want to predict Shotzi in this match with Ronda Rousey? No? <laughs> no. All right. Is the real question here just what is going to take place after this? Because Who there's returns? got to be a reason. Yes. Yeah, because there's got to be a reason that this is on the pay-per-view, not on TV. Well, it could be the return of uh, everyone's favorite. If you want another Charlotte Ronda Rousey match, could always do that. Won't be Mandy. She's still the champion on NXT. But, uh, yeah, Ronda's going to uh, uh, eliminate Shotzi here very quickly. Then we got AJ versus Finn Balor. OC will be at ringside. Luke Gallows, Carl Anderson, and yes... She's Mia Yim again against uh, Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and Rhea Ripley. They did a, a goofy social media angle where Dominic and Rhea Ripley went to Rey Mysterio's house and beat him up because he's got a leg injury, and so they're going to use this to keep him out of action until January. And they blurred out his face because he didn't have a mask on and whatever. Something to do. But um, I actually don't know who to even pick right here. I mean... Clearly, this is a long-running feud. I don't know where we're we're going with anything, to be honest with you. So uh, I'm just going to throw out the babyface AJ Styles loses, since we have so many uh, uh, babyfaces going over the main event. Finn Balor wins somehow here on this show. Yeah, I agree, because they're nowhere near done this, and I could see some sort of just riot breaking out around ringside where somebody clocks Styles in the back of the head or something happens where he ends up looking at the lights and Finn Balor's got the victory. So this thing is long from over, I'm sure. Well, then we got the uh, three-way for the United States title. It is Seth Rollins, Bobby Lashley, Austin Theory. And if you guys remember, and how could you not, this geek Austin Theory 
decided he was going to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase on Seth Rollins. And he went out there and he failed and he didn't win the U.S. title. And he was a super geek. And when it was over, a lot of us initially thought the same thing. Well, have you seen this guy's booking lately? All he does is lose. He lost like 14 straight matches. Now he cashes in his briefcase. Not even against Roman Reigns. He cashed in on a title that there's no reason he can't win. He didn't succeed, and he looked like a geek. And a lot of people's initial impression was, well, maybe Hunter doesn't see in this guy what Vince did. Well, then they kept doing shows, and it turns out that they're just rebooting this guy. And they're giving him a, a big push. He's serious now. He doesn't have his camera. Maybe he lost his phone, for all I know. But... Having seen all of that now, I think that the booking was, you're going to cash in, you're going to fail, we're going to set up a three-way, you're going to win the title at Survivor Series. So my prediction is that Austin Theory is going to win this match probably, I mean, if you look at the way they book, uh, Bobby Lashley is going to have the win over Seth Rollins, Austin Theory is going to steal the pin He's going to beat Bobby Lashley, roll him up or something. And so Seth won't get pinned to lose the belt. Austin will beat Bobby Lashley because Bobby Lashley cost him the money in the bank deal. And everybody will have gotten something out of this whole deal. So Austin beats Lashley to win the title is my prediction. And you can continue on with it if you want, because Seth Rollins delivering a curb stomp to Bobby Lashley and Theory hitting the A-Town down on him, rolling him out of the ring and pinning Bobby Lashley. Sure, we've seen that in different incarnations before, but we could absolutely see it here. And I was one of those people that from day one thought that's exactly what they were doing with Austin Theory. And that seems to be exactly what they've done. And now, depending on what exactly you are doing with Seth Rollins as a character, and whether he's a heel or a babyface or not, you still have Austin Theory now accomplishing something on his own that... He didn't directly do himself. You know, he didn't hit the move that actually led to the guy being down that got the victory. So you still have a heel theory that can be cocky walking around with the belt, but still have Bobby Lashley or Seth Rollins or both look at him and go, now, nah, you know, you, you cheated the system again or whatever it's going to be. So with theory and one or at least one of those guys, something is probably going to continue on. It's just with Seth Rollins. Who the hell knows? Some other news notes, and we'll go to Dynamite after the break. A second Wrestle Kingdom event has been announced January 21 at the Yokohama Arena. The Wrestle Kingdom 17 party will not be finished with the Tokyo Dome, reads the website. After January 8, 2022, saw a third night of Wrestle Kingdom sell out at the Yokohama Arena. January 21, we'll see this special festival of an event for the second year. Uh, this year... And they're talking about uh, 2022. New Japan and Pro Wrestling Noah collided on a card full of interpromotional battles. What does this special night have in store for 2023? Stay tuned for more information. So this show is on a Saturday. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is going to be a New Japan AEW joint show. Because it's not official what it's going to be. But... AEW wrestlers are available on a Saturday night. And in fact, they will be finishing up a tour of the West Coast prior to this event. And so uh, that would be, I won't say a quick flight, but it would certainly be quicker than trying to go to Japan from, say, uh, New Jersey. So uh, it is possible that they're going to run uh, the West Coast and then uh, fly to Japan for a January 21st joint show with New Japan at the Yokohama Arena. So I guess we shall see. Yeah, it could be a really, really interesting show because now with Stardom and, and New Japan working together, the idea that you could see some Stardom talent mix in with AEW talent, if that's the direction that they decide to go, do they bring in? Let's say a team like Strong Hearts again, you bring in Shima and Lindemann and those guys, you bring them over from Glate, and you have them face off against maybe the Death Triangle. It gives you so many different, you know, options right now because in Japan, the way it's looking, you know, 
everybody right now, I'm not saying everybody is working with everyone, but we've seen a little bit more openness to that. So you get a card like this that certainly is going to be, you know, somewhat of a spectacle no matter who's involved with it. The possibilities for some really cool matches is way, way up there. I want to note the uh, Tuesday NXT show, 624,000 viewers and a uh, point one two. Point one two sucks. Uh, 692 is, or 624 is not a bad uh, viewership, but uh, I think everything was down except old people again for this show. And uh, should note that today I am here in uh, lovely Cannon Beach on the west coast of America. And uh, the second this show ends, Rampage starts. 1 p.m. on the west coast. 4 p.m. on the east coast. So when uh, we get these Rampage uh, numbers early next week, hopefully Twitter's dead by then. And I don't have to deal with that stupidity. Because Dynamite's also not going to do a very good number on uh, Thanksgiving Eve. It never does. You'll also be able to point out, though, the numbers that WWE does on FS1. because I think that's that, next week. Is that next weekend? But I think it's, it's not yeah. tonight, for sure. I, again, it, it's so... People are going to do what they're going to do with this, but, I mean, this is one of those times where the numbers are going to lie to you somewhat because of what history has told us about the DVR. So, like, there are DVR plus seven numbers, and that's apparently where... Shows like this for AEW ultimately end up, believe it or not, getting a lot of that audience or at least some of that audience back with people who have watched the show two, three, four days later because they've been with family, because they've been traveling or whatever the issue is. So, yeah, next Friday, SmackDown is on FS1. It will die. It will do uh, around 800,000 viewers. Normally they do... 2.2 million. Man, if if I had a stock... If I ever mention this, if I had a stock. But anyway, uh, tonight it's at uh, 1 Pacific, 4 Eastern. So as soon as this show's over, you guys can watch Rampage. Uh, Both are not going to do well at all. But what can you do? Right? I wonder if they've been promoting this heavily, to be honest with you. I don't know how many people actually realize it. No one on the chat had any idea until I mentioned it. (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, well. Everybody's in there, their World Cup right now, so. Except for yeah, I ain't going to be watching it. One, I got things I got to do today. My super followers, who are not super followers anymore, Twitter changed their name to subscribers. How boring is that? They have gotten a special travelogue of my Thanksgiving trip down here. And, in fact, they got to see a photo of, uh, of my tire, which was... Uh, I mean, destroyed. Absolutely, Ooh. completely decimated Shredded. on the way down yeah. here. Bro, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I live in Washington, and Cannon Beach is in Oregon. So in order to get here, I have to drive over a large bridge that separates Washington and Oregon. The moment I got on this bridge, the tire blew. There's nowhere to pull over on a bridge. I had to get to the other side of the bridge, like Sleepy Hollow. I had to get to the other side of the bridge before I could pull over. Dude, you should have seen this tire when I got to the other side of the bridge. And then, and then, a phantom hitchhiker, a ghost, I think, pulled up behind us. This dude who, I mean, straight out of the 60s, he he had the mustache, his shoes were from the 60s. He got out. It's like 70. He goes, I'm a mechanic. Changed the whole tire. We turned around. He was gone. You think I'm making that up? I'm not. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. What an irony. We got a fell in the Twitch chat called Heel Tires. <laughs> and everyone's asking, can you change? Of course I can change a tire. That's beside the point. I didn't even need to. This guy pulled over, and he was out of the car, and this thing was up on the jack like, ba-bam. And then he tightened that last lug nut, and we tried to hand him cash, and he pushed our hand away, and he was gone. Gone! So, 
Some mechanics live for moments like that. To play oh, Superman, man, to did. come over, save the day. Yeah, they love that stuff. Some love that stuff. And then, and then it was a spare tire. So I had to drive another hour and a half to get to Cannon Beach on this tire. Couldn't go over 50. And these are these are like two-lane roads. And so, man, there were people behind me that were mad. I was like, you know how many times I've been mad about this same thing, and now I am the reason for this slowdown. Had to keep pulling. Oh, oh this was quite the trip. Yeah. But then, you know what? He, he was as he was driving off, you know what I said to him? I go, we got a Black Friday sale, buddy! <laughs> And I plugged that today at WrestlingObserver.com for only 99 cents. Not our usual, not our usual $12.99 per month. 99 cents, a full month of WrestlingObserver.com. You can listen to all our shows. You know, tomorrow is Survivor Series, and Dave Meltzer and I are going to be up immediately after the show or very shortly after the show with a Survivor Series pay-per-view report and all the news. And then Sunday, Vinny and I are going to do the same thing. And then Monday, there's Observer Live, Filthy Four Daily with Tom Lawler, and Observer Radio, three hours worth of podcasts in one day. Now, multiply that. 17 years. 17 years of shows. 14,000 Archived shows for 99 cents. You know what I'm going to do? What are you going to do? do some math. This is, not even, this is not even counting observers. 0. 0.99 right. divided by 14,000. Okay? You're paying per podcast, everybody, today only, 0. 0.00007 cents per show. That's about what most so, artists get off of streaming now. What are you waiting for? Why haven't you gone to WrestlingObserver.com and signed up yet? Don't miss this. It's 99 cents. Now, let's talk about this Dynamite show. Oh, there's a lot to say about this show. Well, first we had uh, William Regal come out. And uh, he's hated. John Moxley immediately appears. He's going to kill William Regal. For helping MJF win the title. Regal, by the way, notes, no MJF this week. He didn't want to come to this town. He's busy filling a move. And he wasn't actually on the show. He'll be back next week. But he comes out, and uh, John Moxley wants to kill him. And Brian Danielson begs John Moxley not to kill William Regal, noting that he loves this man. Everybody, all of them have done bad things in their lives. And the things that William Regal has done for him, he says, please, just let him go. And so John Moxley tells Regal, what I want you to do is just go. Walk, don't come back. And William Regal ends up leaving. And so uh, next week, MJF is going to explain why Regal turned. Regal sent him an email, another email. And it will all be explained, he says, next week. Now, I should mention that when this was over, the immediate assumption all over the Internet is that Regal is gone and he is going back to WWE, okay? I do not know if William Regal is going back to WWE. He may very well be going back to WWE. But I don't believe that if he is going or if he is not, one way or the other, I don't think this was his last show. I think there's more to come in this story. So he still could go at some point, but I don't think that this was like the William Regal swan song from, from AEW. Renee's going to interview Keith Lee, and uh, Lee doesn't even say a word before Swerve shows up. They agree to talk off screen. We had Orange Cassidy versus Jake Hager for the AEW All Atlantic title. Fun match. Everybody was at ringside. We had dives out of the pile. We had comedy. We had wrestling. And uh, finally, you know, Jake Hager loves that hat. And he was so busy worrying about his hat that he got rolled up and pinned. And then QT and the Factory come out. And uh, before they can say a word, Julia Hart appears. House of Black, all of them are back. And first they annihilate the baby faces. The Factory is so happy to see them annihilate the baby faces. Until they annihilate the Factory. And the story here is that the House of Black has returned. And they're going to take out everybody. Baby faces and heels alike. We had Ricky Starks, Ethan Page in the finals of the Eliminator Tournament. And Ricky Starks is taped up like a mummy. And he sells and he sells. They had a good match. And in the end, Ricky Starks won. 
got the victory. He will be facing MJF at Winners Coming on December 14th. And uh, I don't know how long, you know, there were there were uh, discussions back and forth about what to do at the pay-per-view. I don't know if any of the discussions involved MGF not winning. But, you know, from day one, they were pushing Ethan Page as the potential winner of this tournament. And I, I wonder if maybe there was a back and forth about who should win at the pay-per-view. And so if Moxley won, Ethan Page was going to win the tournament. And if MJF won then Ricky Starks was going to win the tournament. But one way or the other, Ricky won. It's babyface versus heel, and that's coming up December 14th, and I don't think that uh, Ricky Starks is going to win. But I've been wrong before. You remember Jade Cargill and Bow Wow? Well, the follow-up was, we ain't going to talk about Bow Wow. And Kira Hogan was fired. Boo. So, hey... You know, she's she's not a bad worker, and she's got charisma, and uh, I think she's going to be all right on her own. I think she's got more to offer than just being a baddie, in my opinion. <laughs> well, she does, and you know what? The team with Tasha Steeles that she had an impact. Again, bigger fish in a much smaller pond at the time, but, you know, them as a group, I thought that was good. We'll see how she does on her own. Oh, you know, I'm going to wait till the end to talk about this next match. Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker beat Sky Blue and Willow Nightingale and Ty Mello and Anna Jay. They announced a lot here, actually, before the match. Thunder Rosa has been stripped of the title. She is no longer the champion. Jamie Hayter is no longer the interim champion. She is now the full-on champion. And they added that um, Tony Storm who was an interim champion her entire reign, is now going to be remembered as the champion. Yes. Yes, Mike? No, nothing. I was trying to signal our video guy to switch the shot back to you. Oh, no, we like we like just looking at you where, staring off into space. But anyway, uh, so now Jamie Hayter's a champion. They are going to interview her, but Britt just cuts her off, cuts the promo. And then they, uh, they do the match, and Britt Baker gets the pin. Now, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but I do not remember the last time Britt Baker got a win. She has been doing job after job after job after job. Now she won, so that tells me that uh, they're doing whatever the build is going to be to the Britt Baker-Jamie Hayter split and feud over this title. So there was nothing in the match that indicated that, but her winning and also cutting off Jamie Hayter, I mean, we're, we're moving to that at this point, I would say. Acclaimed promo, which literally led to nothing except a uh, Jay Lethal, a Jeff Jarrett. Uh, they all appeared backstage, and it looks like that's going to be the next match. Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett versus the Acclaimed for the tag team titles. <laughs> well, it's team. All right. And my God, this main event. Chris Jericho and Tomohiro Ishii. And you know... Seen a lot of matches where guys chop the bejesus out of each other and their their chest ends up bleeding. And uh Buddy Wayne and I, we would chop each other, we would chop the hell out of each other, and we'd have, you know, cuts everywhere. Tom and I as well. And Marco. You know who chopped me harder than anybody in my career was that little idiot Marco stunt. <laughs> that guy, that little moron chopped me so hard. But bro, never, never did I look like Chris Jericho. This dude, not only did he get busted open, he's freaking pouring blood out of his chest in this match with the Shii. They did a total Ishii style match. They're doing the forearms, they're doing the chops, they're doing the, you know, lean into the punches, the one count kick out by Ishii. This place is going crazy for Ishii. And Ishii's done matches that were good, that the crowd, you know, they liked it and everything like that, and they cheered and everything, but... Man, they got into Ishii like, this guy's the greatest. And uh, Jericho was awesome. Ishii was awesome. The crowd loved it. The match starts out. You can see on video here. The match starts out with they're supposed to do the handshake. Jericho flips the guy off. Finally, at the end, after this battle, Jericho puts this guy in the lion tamer. Ishii in the lion tamer flips off Jericho, and then he taps with his middle finger. I... Loved this match. Jericho retains the title, and then uh, Claudio Castagnoli lays him out afterwards as he went after Ian Riccoboni, 
And uh, why, you ask? Well, you'll find out in 10 minutes on Rampage. Now, very quickly, we've got to talk about this tag match. Left myself some time. The match is a death triangle against the Elite. Second match of the best of seven for the trio's titles. Okay. Now, long story short, just the match itself. Great match, all the nuttiness. And then finally at the end, Matt Jackson gets a hold of a hammer. He's going to get his revenge. But Penta gets a second hammer, and he hits Matt Jackson, pins him. So uh, if you remember the first match, they're, they're, they're subtly telling a story here. Pac wanted Phoenix to cheat. Phoenix never wanted to cheat. He gave him the opportunity to cheat at the pay-per-view. Phoenix wouldn't do it. Finally, at the end of the match, Phoenix is being hoisted up. Pac forces a hammer into his hand, and, and Phoenix has two options. Die or use the hammer. He uses the hammer, he gets to win, but he's still not happy with himself. This Penta. Sierra Miedo. He don't care. Man, he used that hammer. He was joyful to hit Matt Jackson with this hammer. So the Elite is down by two now, going into the next match. And, uh, of course, all everybody's talking about is uh, the Elite mocking CM Punk. And uh, everyone, you know, in the Internet has chosen their sides. And the, uh, the, sides, the side that uh, is behind the Elite, they, they're laughing. And the side that is uh, behind CM Punk, they're absolutely disgusted. And, uh, and I don't want to pick sides here because it makes people mad. But I want to make uh, just a couple of comments. Number one. I heard people go, I can't believe they were mocking CM Punk unprovoked. Dude, listen, I don't care whose side you were on, but dude, the Elite came out on the ramp and the fans were chanting F the Elite. They were chanting CM Punk. They were on the Elite the entire match. And the Elite decided, you know what? Dude, we're going to just do what we're going to do. Now, I can tell you, and I don't know about all of them, but there was stuff that was done in the match that uh, that was not something that they planned going out there. They were out there. They they knew they were going to be heels. I mean, they, they figured they were going to be booed. But in the heat of the moment, when the fans were on them, they decided, let's have some fun with this, and that's what they did. There was no, hey, let's plan out some stuff to irritate the people or anything like that. And, uh, and the other thing I'm going to say, and we don't know this, but... If the tables had been turned and the Elite were out of here and CM Punk was wrestling this match and the fans were chanting FCM Punk in Rancho Cucamonga, you don't think Punk would have gone with it? Of course he would have! And he should have. Back in a moment, Observer Live. You know, I gotta say one last thing about this before, uh, before we run out of time. You know what's funny about the whole thing is even if you you didn't like what the elite did, I mean the fact of the matter is it's wrestling, and the idea is to give the crowd what they want and entertain them, and those fans wanted to hate the elite, and the elite saw it and they leaned into it, and the the attempted buckshot where Matt fell down during the commercial break. I mean, you could just see the fans were eating this stuff up. And it didn't hurt the match at all. In fact, if anything, it enhanced the match. The end of the match, the fans are going nuts with this is awesome chance for this thing. They entertained the fans. The fans had a great time. They got to boo the hell out of the Elite. The Elite gave them stuff to boo. Nobody got hurt about it. I don't know. I think it's much ado about nothing in this case. I just got a big kick out of the fact that Wednesday night the show was over with. There were people that were, of course, vehemently against the elite. There were people that were fighting those people by being vehemently against CM Punk. And then there was another sliver of people that just looked at all of this and went, you know what? This is all a work. He's coming back. (laughs) I can't. I cannot tell you how many times. I actually have heard people go, damn it, this guy's coming back. He's coming back. He's got to be coming back, right? So we'll see. Well, you know, (laughs) he's not coming back. If that's what you, if that is a conclusion anybody got out of this match, I can tell you 
that he is not coming. Well, you know, I can't say he's not soon. Let me put it this way. Not soon. Let me put it this way. (laughs) He might come back someday. But my point is, what they did in this match was not sending you, the audience, a clue that he was imminently coming back or was going to come back. Like at this point, at this point, there are no plans for him to come back. That doesn't mean that everything could change. But if you watch and you were like, oh, man, you know, for sure after this, you, that's not what this was. This was a fa- this was a fan base that was rabid. They decided to play to it, and that's what it was. And you ain't going to see it next week. Right at a time. Happy Black Friday, everybody. Hey, don't forget, wrestling.